Hi everyone, I'm here today to talk to you about all of the books that I read in March. As usual, I will link all of them in the description box down below if you would like to go and find out more. I read quite a few things, some of those were different to the kind of books I would normally pick up. Some of them I haven't finished yet, it's all a little bit all over the place, but I feel like en masse we're all a bit all over the place, so that's fine. So firstly, I say firstly, this is in no organised order, it's literally just what was on top of the pile. I am in the middle of Through the Looking Glass by Lewis Carroll, which is the follow-up to Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. I'm currently reading this on Instagram Live every day at 3pm BST, and then that's saved to my profile for 24 hours. So if you would like to listen to me read Alice in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass, then you can do that. And um, for the next few days, I may pick another book to do after these have finished. But I decided to pick them up because they're one of my favorite childhood, but one of my favorite, these are two of my favorite childhood books. Um, Through the Looking Glass is my particular favorite and it kind of seemed apt because Alice is confused, everything is changing around her, she's not sure if she's awake or dreaming um, and she is told that it is usual in Wonderland to be made to believe six impossible things before breakfast and I feel like that is what we are doing right now so it has been a joy to revisit these and thanks to those of you who have been listening in. I also read Disfigured in March, this is by Amanda Leduc, the subtitle is On Fairy Tales, Disability and Making Space. Amanda wrote to me, she sent me an email when she was writing this book because as you can tell, this is right up my street and she'd been watching my videos on these topics um, and we had a bit of a chat and I was very excited to read the book that she was putting together. So this is um, part memoir, part analysis and she's talking about growing up with cerebral palsy and seeing herself or not seeing herself reflected in stories. She's talking about disfigurement and disability used as villainy or as inspiration porn. She's talking about disability as it is framed in different fairy tales and why that is the case. Um, and not just looking at traditional fairy tales, but then looking at Marvel uh, and comics and how disfigurement is talked about in, in those. So as you can see for me, tick, 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 all of the ticked boxes. Um, so it was really lovely to read this. Um, I found myself nodding along all the way through. I've underlined some bits, so let me find an extract for me to read to you quickly. Oh yeah, so whilst I said I was nodding my way through most of this, there were some moments where she'd said things that I hadn't really considered before um, and wholeheartedly agreed with, but I don't know, just something clicked for me. Um, so she's talking about superheroes, she's talking about Marvel. She says, I didn't fantasize back then about what the world might look like if it was actually fair, if there were no need for superheroes at all. I didn't imagine what life might be like in a world without bullying. I took her for granted that the bullying would come because I walked differently and occupied a different space. And the world I lived in told me that that was what happened to bodies that were different. It seemed easier for me to imagine a world where I had magical powers than a world where different bodies just existed together side by side. Ouch, ouch, yes. Um, so yeah, I thought this was great. It was weird reading this because as I said, this is what I talk about um, and I'm also working on something that has similar elements to it but there's room enough for all of us and we're def definitely um, very different people with very different styles so it was bizarre to read a book where so many things felt like things that had come out of my own head but had actually come out of somebody else's but also that was really reassuring so yes if you enjoy my videos on disfigurement and fairy tales you will enjoy this too. Let's talk about a book quickly that um, I have put down for now, but we'll be coming back to you. And I'm mentioning it here because I think I said in my last wrap up that I was planning to read it. I'm still planning to read it. This is Wolf Hall by Hilary Mantel. I am only up to page 65. It is masterful, it is wonderful, it is intense. And you need a lot of brain power and brain space to read this and absorb everything that she is saying. I feel like I could read it right now, but I don't feel like I would be paying it the right amount of respect to read it right now because I don't really feel up to it. So I'm shelving it for now, but I will come back to it. And also I am gonna be reviewing all of the Women's Prize shortlisted books. And The Mirror and the Light is currently longlisted for the Women's Prize. So if it's shortlisted, I will have to read this and Bringing Up the Bodies and The Mirror and the Light very soon, though not as soon as I would have needed to beforehand because they've announced that 
the winner announcement will now be in September as opposed to June. So I have time. Um, I'm going to be coming back to this um, regardless of whether or not the third one is um, shortlisted. I'm currently reading this as research for something that I am writing at the moment. It's called A Time to Dance, A Time to Die, The Extraordinary Story of the Dancing Plague of 1518. So this is the real life Dancing Plague of 1518 where hundreds of people danced until they died and people don't know why that happened. There was lots of speculation, maybe they had eaten something, um, effectively a drug that had made them high and they danced and didn't know when to stop. But um, from the introduction, that seems to be refuted. So it's more about mass hysteria. Um, and I think it'll probably tie in with uh, talking about hysteria to do with witch trials and stuff like that. And I'm interested into how these historical events feed into fairy tales such as the red shoes. Um, so I'll talk about it more once I finish reading it, but I'm enjoying reading it so far. Now for something um, slightly different. I read Red, White and Royal Blue by Casey McQuiston because Lex had been talking about it so much and I thought, I would treat myself to this. Um, had I read this as a teenager, I would have loved it oh so much. Reading it as an adult, there were bits I loved and then there were bits that were too sugary sweet and I couldn't get fully invested in it. I felt like this was something for a past version of me. Um, so that was, that was a bit of a shame. What's it about, Jen? This is about Prince Henry who is heir to the throne here and then it's about Alex who is the son of the President of the United States. The two of them hate each other, a trope I don't like, and then they fall in love and they have to hide their relationship and we go from there. It has lots of humour in it, there's a lot of sex in it and there's a lot of politics in it. Um, I like the humour and the sexy bits, the politics so much at the beginning I didn't feel like it worked, it didn't feel like those themes all married together well. I thought they did by the end, but at the beginning, I don't know, I wasn't completely sold on it. I could tell that Casey McQuiston has written so much Remus and Sirius fan fiction, and that is not an insult because I have written my fair share of Remus and Sirius fan fiction oh so much over the years. Um, so this was like reading the shoebox project, really, in style and tone. And there are characters in here who would definitely equate to Remus, Sirius, James and Lily and then they pair up like that. It's one of those books where everything gets tied up so beautifully. I can see this being a film and I just, I don't know if I'm cynical, I don't know what, but I just couldn't lose myself in it as much as I wanted to. But if you are still reading lots of fan fiction and if you do read a lot of romance as well and you want something that will make your heart happy, this will tick those boxes. I promise. Two books that I would happily link together. Mr M and I listened to the audiobook of The Call of the Weird by Louis Theroux. We've started listening to an audiobook just before bed. Um, I will say though, because it's an audiobook I'm exclusively listening to before bed, I don't think that I have, as with Wolf Hall, paid this audiobook the amount of respect that it deserves because I have drifted off in places. So you're not going to get any in-depth thoughts from me on that book at all, but it was really lovely to listen to. Um, we've also been re-watching some of his documentaries, especially his documentary with Joe Exotic. We watched that after watching The Tiger King. Um, so Call of the Weird is one of his older books and he's revisiting people that he had previously filmed documentaries about. It was very interesting. Um, it wasn't anything mind-blowing and I will say that Louis's accents are hilarious and not always in the best way. Um, but the one that I would link that with is this one which I'm in the middle of reading and it's Notes from an Apocalypse, A Personal Journey to the End of the World and Back by Mark O'Connell. Mark is the author of To Be a Machine which won the Welcome Prize a couple of years ago. He was really anxious about the end of the world um, and he wanted to go and talk to people who were also anxious about that in order to try and make himself feel better. Not necessarily because he's talking to like-minded folk, but just seeing how that anxiety materialises in other people and how people have 
made that anxiety into something which they would class as productive. So we're looking at hoarders, we're looking at people who've invested in bunkers, we're looking at people who've exploited the worries of others by building really expensive bunkers, um, talking to billionaires who would like to move to Mars, talking to the people who have been really proactive about climate change as well. This is a strange one to be reading now. And um, I picked it up, I think, because I wanted to read something that kind of relates to the current situation without it being a novel about, you know, a plague. I don't want to read Station Eleven right now. I've read Station Eleven, it's great. I'm not drawn to reading apocalyptic fiction, but this is looking at people who have always worried about, not this specific thing, but about things like that and why. Uh, and I find that fascinating. I guess it's a way that I want to access a situation in book form in a slightly removed way, but in a factual way. I guess that is just where I feel most comfortable, but comfortable seems like an, a strange word to use right now. The best book that I read last month was this one, which is The Bass Rock by Evie Wilde. It is so brilliant. It's set across three different time periods. The first one is the 1700s, and it's about a woman called Sarah who's been accused of witchcraft. Her section is narrated by a man who is watching her. Then the second section is about Ruth, who is a woman in the 1940s. She has just married a man whose wife recently died and she's trying to bond with his two sons. And her section is told in third person. And then the modern day section is about Viv, who has gone to Ruth's house to clear it all out. Um, she is a relative of hers and her section is told in first person. So across the timelines, we see women gradually being able to claim their own story and give voice to it. I described this in a review that I did for Toast, if we're gonna do book maths, as this is Sarah Waters meets Ali Smith meets Fleabag. It's so funny, it's also so dark and gothic and atmospheric, powerful. The voices in here sing, they really, really do. Um, I reviewed this for Toast, so I'll link my review in the description box down below if you would like to go and check that out. And as you're watching this on Monday, I am doing an Instagram Live with Evie on Wednesday between six and seven over on the Toast Instagram. So if you would like to go and watch that, then make a note of that time. It'll also be available for 24 hours after that and you'll be able to ask her any questions. If you can't make the live and you have a question that you would like to leave Evie, you can leave it in a comment down below or you can message me if you would like to as well. A book that I had hoped to love but had reservations about but went in hoping for the best is Queenie by Candice Carty Williams. This is not normally a kind of book that I would generally read. I don't tend to read lots of commercial fiction. And when it came out, I had read the blurb and I thought that sounds really great, but not really one for me. Lots of people who also don't normally read commercial fiction then read it and raved about how brilliant it was. So I thought, well, okay, I would like to read something like this. Let me give it a go. And unfortunately, I just didn't get on with it very well. And I don't think that's the fault of the book per se. I should just have trusted my gut instinct and gone for a genre of book that I normally go to instead. There were things that I really liked about it. This is about Queenie, who's in her 20s. She's a black woman living in London. She is going through a rough time with her boyfriend, Tom, who's white, and he doesn't understand her. He is very aggressive towards her, lots of gaslighting, um, and she puts herself in lots of vulnerable situations because she's been made to feel worthless. I really loved the ideas that were explored in here. And I also love the friendships that Queenie has as well. Um, and some of the dialogue is really funny. At the same time, I found the text quite clumsy. I didn't really feel like everything came together very well. And that was disappointing. So it wasn't really in the end one for me. Speaking of not really reading commercial fiction, I revisited 10 books this month, last month, that definitely fall under the umbrella of commercial fiction that I adored when I was a teenager. This is the Angus Thongs and Full Frontal Snogging series by Louise Renison. Um, I just needed to revisit something that I knew would really make me laugh. So I read these 10 books in a weekend. I vlogged the whole thing, so I'll link that in the description box down below if you would like to go and see how I got on with that. In short, I really enjoyed it. Lots of things haven't aged well. The first five books definitely worth, worth the revisit. The second five really not so much at all. But I had a really fun weekend trying to get through all of those books. And I know that Emma and her sister have just done a readathon, a 24 hour readathon, where they have read 
all 10 books as well. And that video I think will be going up this week. So I'll also link that in the description because I'm really looking forward to seeing that because um, I'm sure it's gonna be hilarious. Finally, a couple of thoughts on some audiobooks. I'm just getting them up on my phone so that I remember. Um, two more audiobooks. So I listened to We Have Always Been Here, a queer Muslim memoir by Samra Habib. I read this again at the beginning of the month. It's a really short book. The audiobook is only five hours long. She's talking about growing up um, in Pakistan as a young Muslim girl and then moving to Canada um, as a refugee with her family. And the book doesn't really focus on queerness. I thought it would focus on that much more. That's definitely towards the end of the book. I think had it focused on that, I would have enjoyed it more. I felt as though a lot of the book was giving context to the things that she later talked about in detail. I felt as though the earlier sections, um, they could have had more to them or we could have missed out more elements and expanded on her discussion towards the end where she's talking about coming out as queer and being in lots of different relationships with lots of different people and traveling around a lot. Um, and that was done really, really quickly. Um, I was really interested in her photography as well, which she talks about towards the end of the book. She talks about photographing queer people and recording their lives. Um, that just sounded wonderful. So. I don't know, it just felt a little bit uneven, um, but I'm glad that I listened to it. And then also a book that I am halfway through, but I have finished one part of it because it's in two parts. So I finished a whole thing. That is Hometown Tales Glasgow by Kirsty Logan and Paul McQuaid. So it's a book that is um, part of a series that a publisher's doing where they get an established author to write 15,000 words about their hometown. And then they get an up and coming author to write 15,000 words about the same hometown and they pair them up. So I listened to the audiobook of this because I love listening to Kirsty. I mean, she's a friend of mine. So I am biased, um, but I think most people would agree that her voice is very beautiful, it feels very lyrical, perfect for fairy tales. And in her part of the book, she's talking about growing up um, and her father being an alcoholic and his death. And she's talking about her family dynamic and loving stories. Um, and it's just so beautifully simple and kind um, and also so honest. There's one part where she's talking about her father and she says, I have written my father into a story. It's the only version of him that I'm allowed to keep. And that's just so, I don't know, it's beautiful. So I really recommend that book, especially the audiobook. I haven't listened to the second half of it yet, Paul's bit. Um, so I'll speak about his bit in my wrap up at the end of next month. So those are all the books that I read in March. As I said, I'm going to link all of them in the description box down below. Have you read any of these? Would you like to? Let me know what you have been reading recently and I'll speak to you all very soon. Lots of bookish love. Bye.